start recording. Hit that record button, Tom. It's been two weeks since you did any streaming, at least. Maybe three. Where have you been, Tom? Where have you been? Ladies and gentlemen, I've been working on a thing. Should I show you the thing? I got a commission to do some 3D animation. Why not? I'll show you the thing. It's, it's pretty cool. It's going to promote this product. Good friend from way back in the day, as in a uh, good person who I consider a friend, not that we're like really tight or anything, uh, reached out to me after the last stream, so I did some 3D work and wanted to uh, collaborate on something. And this is a quick animation of a product that I've been animating for the client. Something called a Cero Bin, and it's a folding trash slash recycling bin that can be used and deployed to events. And it's pretty darn cool. It's really well engineered, really well designed, folds up for storage, and is a lot sturdier than just a generic cardboard box. So this, what that uh, I've been working on is this rendering, this animation, this render. There's another 20 or third, what am I saying? There's another like 10 seconds of animation here, but I just didn't get to rendering it last night because rendering takes a long time in the traditional sense. The big difference between what I used to do in games and what I used to do in college in terms of pre-rendered assets versus real-time assets. In the games world, the art assets need to run at 60 frames a second on a computer, maybe 30 frames a second on the low end, whereas when you're pre-rendering something for a movie or for an animation project or pre bit you can take a lot longer. You can spend days rendering individual frames. In the case of that animation, it was overnight, 10 hours just to get 100 frames of animation. I'm using Arnold, learning a little bit about Arnold Renderer. So what are we going to do today? We're going to draw, we're going to color in this drawing that I'm working on for friend Mike Legrand. I saw one of my drawings and was like, dude, I want to, I have this idea. I have this idea for a picture and I want you to render it out for me. And I was like, cool, let's do it. The idea is just crazy chaos Baltimore with like epic jet kaiju monster battles, but of a Baltimore kind of nature. So what do we have going on? We have the Domino Sugar Factory grabbed the crane from the Museum of Industry, is marching past Federal Hill to get into a fight with a crab, has grabbed its own means of destruction. We got the Pink Poodle, we got the Mr. Bow and Miss Utz, we got the USS Constellation, dinosaurs coming alive from the Museum of Industry, big old ravens dropping some old bay bombs, we got Mr. B&O Train Museum in the background, Baltimore Oriole, electric monster with the hard rock guitar, we got, we got animals escaping from the, the Baltimore Aquarium. The USS Taurus is coming alive. And it's just all kinds of crazy. Even Mr. Trash Wheel's getting involved. So this was about four hours of drawing the other day just to get the sketch that Mike gave me, which is a really cool little uh, paper chicken scratch sketch. I'll show that to embarrass him. Mr. Legrand. So he did this wonderful little sketch. And this is a lot more than I usually get from someone who wants a commission or something. So I actually appreciate that. He has a point of view from Federal Hill with the cannon. He's got some dinosaurs in the lower left. He's got the Domino Sugar Monster. I'm just realizing he's got candy canes on top of his head. I might try to incorporate uh, candy canes. Mr. Trash Reel is going to work with Dragon over there. Uh, crab dude, sharks, all kinds of uh, constellation. So I liked a lot of the ideas here. The perspective was going to be a little confusing for me, and it not quite my style. A, a top side, like linear uh, perspective that would be orthographic. I've seen a lot of posters of that kind of stuff. The shame, the shame. I'm explaining Mike. Mike is here in the channel. I'm explaining the choices I've made here. So... That's funny. Mike Mike chimed in. So this instructed. This is a very good plan for what the drawing ended up being because it had to have all these elements, but I wanted to do it in the more dynamic or heroic kind of perspective. So the first thing I did on this was to load up Google Earth Pro, and I could take the camera into Baltimore City and take snaps of of what 
uh, the Baltimore land skyline looked like from different points of view. So we have, uh, I took some screenshots. Google Earth is absolutely amazing. I've been saying Google Earth is amazing for 10 years now, and it never ceases to amaze me. So all this geometry now is in the world. You can orbit around. You can put on VR goggles if you have them and feel like you're a gigantic King Kong or kaiju monster stomping around any city on the planet pretty much and you're gonna have a really good uh, point of view so I brought the camera around and I tried to look at what Baltimore was like from Mike's perspective that he did in the sketch and that perspective everyone gets because that's the most common skyline picture of Baltimore is from on top of Federal Hill it's a nice place to be it's a good vantage point the air is nice there's a breeze and in Baltimore a breeze is everything because it gets pretty warm um, and I was not thrilled about how small the actual harbor was from that point of view. I wanted the harbor to really be the star of the show, especially with the constellation. I love naval history. I read the Master and Commander series when I was growing up. So here we go, just orbiting around. I tried bringing the camera low, and then the buildings feel... When, when the camera's lower, the buildings look taller, but they're also further away, and... The lot in the foreground was just a little messy and confusing. Plus, that foreground lot I know is under renovation, Mike. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a skate park going in to where the uh, sand pits are for volleyball, among other things. So that's changing. That's in the process of, of changing. Got some reference pictures. This is actually the USS Constitution. The Constellation hasn't been sailing under power for a long time. But I believe they're sister ships, or they're in the, they're in a similar class. So I thought I could get references for the rigging and the and, uh, flags and sails and stuff from the constellation. This is funny because I'm live streaming and we're having a live meeting right now with Mike about what he wants to do. Mike, chime in with what you know you want, you want to do differently. Anyway, Google is amazing. So I just realized from from the pictures I had of from Google Earth of Baltimore. It wasn't giving me a sense of, of adventure and exploration and excitement that I have inside my head. The visuals didn't line up with what I was thinking about. And what I was actually thinking about, it took me a while to realize this, was when I used to go sailing in Baltimore Harbor. I had some friends that had some friends that had some sailboats, and I used to go out sailing on a Tuesday night after work, or went Thursday night after work and do some races. A uh, really good guy um, named Mark took me on his boat, which I think his boat was called Monkey Business. Is that right? No, Monkey Business was James James's boat. Uh, but it was a really good group. It was really cool uh, group sailing kind of activity. And coming in and out of the harbor from the water is absolutely the most impressive way to see Baltimore. So either water taxi or getting on a sailboat or getting on one of those little dragon boats and sailing around when you're in the middle. And the city of Baltimore is this bowl around you. That's the coolest view. So I put the camera on the water and then drew the inner harbor around it in an exaggerated kind of way. So we have the Federal Hill, we got the Tomino Sugar Factory, and we got the um, aquarium on the right. Now, I'm kind of taking some liberties with where stuff's going. For instance, I got the power plant stacked up right behind the aquarium, but it's going to be confusing. There's parts of like Fells Point that really could belong in this drawing. You could have the Broadway Pier kind of jetting out on the right corner. Maybe I could expand it to include it. All right. Let me draw a little bit to show the actual drawing process. Mike's saying this view is so much better. Obviously, the whole thing is so much better than I'd imagined. Oh, awesome. Glad to hear you're excited about it. Another thing is i got to get myself jazzed about it, too. And to get myself jazzed about something, I'm usually having to solve some kind of problem. I have to create an extra challenge that makes makes the the composition interesting uh, in a creative way all right all right all right um, establishing the horizon line is also always very important for what you want to do if you're putting the horizon line high that means the camera's looking down and everything is diminutive to where the point of view is so that the steeper that god's eye point of view is the less threatening the subject matter in that point of view is too. 
Um, so the lower the horizon line, the lower the camera, looking up at something, everything else is going to be bigger. I wanted Baltimore and everything to feel bigger and more imposing. So getting in pretty tight with the ship, you probably can tell I spent the most time with the ship. Um, my dad was a big Navy fan, Navy guy. He was in the Navy for four years, serving the carrier Lexington. Um, and I grew up with just a lot of naval memorabilia around the house. So my familiarity with little ships is uh, probably what I was most familiar with in this scene. The second most thing I'm familiar with down in Baltimore, personally, is the B&O Train Museum. So this, this character back here wasn't even a request, but I wanted to add it just as my own little uh, creative uh, addition to the project. There was a game I worked on back in 2006 called Sid Meier's Railroads, and one of my jobs on that was modeling locomotives. So we went down to the B&O Railroad Museum several times, uh, twice for research and once for a party. After the game shipped, we actually rented out the, the building and had a big Christmas party there. It was awesome. Having dinner and then a bunch of trains are all around you. So I learned a lot about locomotives in that time. So maybe today what I'm going to do is redraw this guy because he's kind of flat and boring. I think he's a cool idea, but he's kind of stiff. I think I want him just to cheat it to a 45 degree angle in some way. So anyone here, please uh, hop in, say you're here. It's hard for me to tell who's in the stream. Uh, I think, I know Mike's in here clearly, and maybe uh, maybe Brandon's here. I can't really tell. Facebook stream is a little, has a little bit to be desired, but it works. So I'm, I'm thrilled it works. Here we are. Here we are on a Friday. What am, what am I going to do with this guy? So first of all, I, I want to back up and save this just in case. So I'm going to select this dude, a little bit of the Seltzer Tower, and I'm going to copy that and, and paste it just to have a backup version. So in case I do anything, I still have I still have that guy as a, as a backup I can put him back in. So we call that backup train man. What's this folder understanding? Oh, I think I did some sketches planning stuff out. Oh, this is interesting for Mike. So I actually did do a sketch based on his point of view. And I was I was just frustrated with what um, uh, as far, the diminutive size of stuff. As I started drawing it, I realized everything's below the camera point of view and doesn't feel as intimidating as epic because we're high and removed on Federal Hill behind a line of cannonades and stuff. Nothing's really threatening from that point of view. I wanted to you know, really feel like we were in the mix of a melee. So that's why uh, there's a folder called Understanding there. All right, let's go back to the train view. Probably good at this point. Also, another way to back up stuff is just save another version. So save, let's, let's do Mike's Baltimore 3. No problem with saving multiple versions of files. we got plenty of hard drive space. Today's coffee is provided by McDonald's. Not great, but it works. It's the new motto. McDonald's, not great, but it works. How many things in your life are not great, but they work? Let's start a conversation in the chat. Good morning, Brandon. What is not great in your life, but works? Tail brace? Sig brace? Scorpio Eva? Uh, Scorpio's pretty good. Not great, but works. High points? I'm not sure. What is something that not that's not great but works? What I what I was watching, I'm gonna try to talk and draw at the same time, and it's gonna be a little challenging. It's gonna be a little challenging. Um let's redraw this guy. I, I put work into it, but I, I I'm just bored with his pose. I like the ideas of what's going on with Train Man. Um, let me see if I can just create a new. Let me, let me, let's get a reference to Train Man up. All right, so he's he's a little reference to Train Man over here, and then we'll move this. I was watching two things that kind of came combined into my head. The Mandalorian is an outstanding show. If you're a true Star Wars fan, just an outstanding show. Now I have not seen the Clone Wars cartoon series in its entirety. I saw the first two seasons of Samurai Jack, the Samurai Jack animators, and it was impeccable, and I thought it was perfect. I did not see the 3D stuff. I thought it looked too cartoony. But now that I know 
that Dave Filoni did a lot of those Clone Wars it makes me want to go back and see it because his interviews on The Mandalorian are the most intelligent thoughts about the Star Wars universe I've ever heard and as to why it works, why it makes sense. And I don't want to paraphrase it, but I think his, his synopsis of the familiar relationships of Anakin and Luke Skywalker are what really drives the whole um, story forward. And in his interviews, they actually don't mention, they don't mention 7, 8, 9, uh, probably because his, his argument falls apart because J.J. Abrams doesn't know what the hell to do with the story. He knows a lot what to do with special effects, but he doesn't know anything to do with the story. That lost drove me crazy. But th that that making of was absolutely fantastic, hearing about why we make stories. He says, Dave Filoni says, we make stories to share knowledge about the human condition. Like sto The good stories that last the test of time are the ones that tell the young generation how to deal better in this world. And... I was like, really? Like, but we like comedy. We like, uh, we like. I like war movies. We like sick. I'm like, what? What are we learning? Well, we're learning communication. Sitcoms. Co comedy tells us about communication, about talking to people, and how to make light of a situation that we might find ourselves in. But usually, there is some kind of conflict and some kind of resolution. So, by exposing yourself to conflicts and seeing how they get resolved, maybe you'll be able to resolve problems faster in your own life. I think war movies are a reflection of the real perils in humanity. And as we, uh, my generation being like early, one of my zennials, some kind of version of the millennial, I think I'm on the older part of the millennial generation. We lived in the best economic times in history, like 85 to 2015. Uh, there was the 2008 crisis, but overall, like if you could trace a, a market line, the growth and expansion of knowledge and information. Some would argue that the 50s were the best time ever because of the ability to buy homes and cars by middle class workers. I think there was too many social problems going on to call those the best times of you know best times ever. I think I think really the 80s um, in America was probably probably where it was at. So this character, what's going to what's going to go? So I want to cheat the character a little bit. So. Let's get some angle, let's get some contrapasta going. So we have the shoulder up, shoulder down, maybe this like head's coming up. I did a Viking drawing a little while ago that had a big giant in the back of it, and I really liked how that came out. Let me see if I can find that and bring it up. Thanks, Jason. Glad you're glad you're digging it, dude. Thanks for joining us today. Tell me what you want to see more of or hear about. If you guys are curious about color. Or just about drawing, uh, let me know. So here's a drawing I did of my friend Samantha, and this was the first sketch for the final piece. She was in the foreground. There was this Scottish or Icelandic uh, mine in the background, and I just painted in a giant monster. Like, hey, what's going on? And I kind of liked how that turned out, so I put more time into it. And ended up finishing him. And I ended up making him look like Techno Viking. You guys know who Techno Viking is? Guy marching on the street, all jacked and ripped, doing like really aggressive moment uh, movements to some EDM dance music. So we put Techno Viking in the background. Techno Viking is a meme from like 2001, back in the day. So I think maybe this guy's like marching. Maybe I got like a really a crazy march. And. Um, He's playing like a trumpet. I don't know why, like a train. I don't know. Marching bands are so surreal. I kind of want this guy to. Is he smoking a train? Is, is that interesting? It's like a peace pipe, smoke pipe thing. Maybe, maybe the viewer can read to this however, however it, it goes. But, uh, maybe, maybe it's a trumpet. Like, I think brass instruments and locomotives have a lot in common. So maybe, like, train, steam-powered trumpet might be kind of cool. Choo-choo, We're going to roll on this bitch. 
Sometimes you just got to draw to make ideas. I often think about drawing as a way of learning. By looking at something and drawing it is forcing a thought and forcing an image through your eyeballs into your brain, frontal, rear, middle cortex, down the spinal column. Medulla oblongata gets involved and then it comes out to your fingertips. And then that's a way that your body is internalizing and physicalizing an idea, seeing it and then bringing it through. I think it's kind of like meditation and yoga and stuff. Like if you can meditate in yoga, it's taking an idea and making it physical. I think we're making it up. Right, so we got we're really changing this guy. Before he was just like BNO trained 40 hands. He couldn't really do anything because his hands were trains. He could like punch. He was kind of boxer-ish, kind of Mike Tyson-ish. Like if you got punched with a train, dude, you'd be messed up. That would hurt. Choo choo! Uh, so, why am I thinking marching band for this guy? I don't know, but I really like it. I really like the marching band um, I, idea. March, like One of my favorite things in media last year, I really got into black southern college football band drum majors. I just thought that was the dopest thing. Like, I think I was struggling with my job a little bit. And when I'm struggling with work, I turn to hip hop. I just love that gangster attitude. Like, con back when I was struggling at Zynga in 2012, I think Legrand was there. That's probably where I met Mike. Like, I was listening to Kanye every day, Mike. Every day, Kanye was on there. Lamborghini, Mercy, Yako, Shito, Thursday. In my two seat Lambo with your girl, she trying to jerk me. Sorry, it's a little dirty for you kids out there. I just loved it. I was like, pop that song, Power. Yeah, it was dope. It got me fired up. Okay, so now I got an issue where the flags, wind's going one way and the steam smoke man's going the other way. Winds can swirl. We'll figure that out later. But I'm already liking this marching band kind of drum major -y guy. And he is going to have all the frills, but the frills are going to be made out of like planking and piping and tubing and, and whatnot. Maybe it's a bit like Yellow Submarine and Pepperland. And Dr. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club kind of band thing. I think it's not going to be a traditional face. It's going to be this like Cyclops dude. And maybe the feather is the smokestack. I think that'd be cool. And B and O. I'm going to claw hand, probably. Giant steam. Steampunk robot. Big fan of Steampunk the game. Alright, so I'm not getting his legs in. Oh no, what did I do? Gotta maybe make him taller. So I have room for his legs. So we'll lasso select and then bring that up. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Look, we need we need some some sonic boom of the south real quick. Sonic Boom of the South, JSU, JSU Band. That's what's up, Jackson State. Oh yeah, these guys, these guys are just incredible. The Jackson State drum majors are, are my favorite. I think just the band Justice turned me on to it because they did a music video called Heavy Metal, which had uh, a Southern College marching band. I'm gonna queue up a little little clip of video of these drum majors come in and you're just not gonna be ready for it. These guys are just awesome. Look at them. Look at them go. Mm, 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 mm. I'm just all excited about it. Alright, 
so we're going to work a little drum major into our train guy. These dudes are amazing. And they got the majorettes behind there doing their dance moves with their capes. Look at these guys go. You got to look up this video. Jackson State University marching in the Mississippi Valley, 2019. Don't look too close because you realize the stadium's in pretty bad shape. But their outfits and their dance moves are outstanding. They got this thump and beat. It's real 70s, it's real funky. Real funky. I love it. I celebrate it. Uh, college football is amazing. It's definitely a cult, but it's also uh, awesome. You follow college football and then you just get wrapped up into it. I think, I wonder how much of the unrest and craziness in society is just there's no sports. There's no sports to calm people up. There's no, you know, water cooler conversations used to be about sports. And now it's about um, the news. It's about the news. And if there if there's water co water cooler conversations to be had. So we got some piping. We have a big like cylinder type thing for a mouth. Think. How, how am I sounding this morning? Just going all right? What's up, John Edwards? Sean Edwards, welcome to the TomCast this morning. How are you, sir? Tell me about where you are and if it's good. And tell me a thing that it isn't good, but is a, is it works. Just like McDonald's coffee. Um, ain't good, but it works. I forget what I said earlier. It was I felt like what I said earlier in the morning made more sense. It was catchy. Locomotive man. When that's kind of lazy. The on the arm by the hip. I think it'd be more interesting if it was further back. So I just might just select this and rotate it out a little bit. Let's take him and move him up just a little bit more. Move him over here. Yeah, I'm already liking this guy a lot more. Just giving it some English. Excuse me, Dutch, Deutsch, the Deutsch camera angle. Let's give it a little Dutch, tilt it this way a little bit. We're a little Dutch this morning. We're a little sideways. This would be normal. This is a little Dutch. Why is it that way? Uh, not intentional. It's just like, the setup I have here is a monitor with a camera barely hanging on in Not great, but okay. What's not great, but okay? I think our systems of laws, <laughs> our system of laws is not great, but okay. It's like what we are able to arrive at. I believe that the laws a nation makes are a form of collective memory. Some of those laws, some of those laws are made long ago. They made sense back in the day. They don't really make sense anymore. Like, I think this war on drugs needs to be completely redone. I think the, the global war on terror needs to be rethought about. The global war on drugs needs to be rethought about. I think there's a lot. Of, uh, 2020, hindsight. Hindsight being 2020. Right now, everyone's got a lot of time to look at their history, at the history on the history books, history not in the history books. And uh, decide what the hey, what's really working here. This is like census 2020. Is like, hey, let's see how many people actually live here. And then there's like social justice 2020, where everyone's like, is this? Are we, are we on the right track? Are we doing the right thing? I think, um, like, there is a fine line between chaos and order, and that's. That's all I gotta say about that. Gotta be careful out there, ladies and gentlemen. Gotta be careful. 
right? This dude's coming here. So his leg's gonna be up. So if one, if the right arm is back, the right leg has to be forward because our, our bodies work in opposite and harmonies. All right, Mike's, uh, Mike's working so he can't chime in. He's just lurking. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Trying to watch a stream while working is an example of something good, something not good but works. Not good but works. That's the phrase. I got to write that down. Not good. You know, chewing gum to keep your book report together. You don't have a paper clip. People ask me, Tom, how do you know so much about so many different things? Well, thank you for saying that, number one. And it's because I can listen to podcasts while I draw. So you know, it's hard to imagine talking and listening to someone at the same time. It doesn't really work. You can't hear someone else while saying words out of your mouth most of the time. I'm sure some expert commentators on various news outlets have mastered that skill, but it is not a typical uh, one. So what um, I do though is you can listen and shut your mouth and put on a podcast and draw at the same time because the drawing is a different part of your brain, for me at least. It, one could argue it's just because anything that you do a lot of has become subconscious and you can run that process in parallel. Whereas difficult problems that you're not used to solving run serially. And I'm dropping computer terms that my friend Brandon and Mike and uh, you nerds out there will understand. Serial or parallel. Serial in order, parallel, multiple processes at the same time. Um, for me, drawing is now a, one of these paralyzed, ah, paralyzed, parallelized, is that a word? Parallelized functions. Talking I'm not as good at, so that is using up most of my central processing unit right now. The speaking, the self-critique, the thinking about what I'm going to say next, the trying to remember that funny thing I had two days ago. I made this funny point in my brain two days ago. I want to do a, let me know if you guys are interested in this. I want to do a demo probably next week about drawing expressions, about the importance of drawing the eyes and different ways to draw the eyes, the secret language of eyeballs, secret universal language. That's another theme we talk about on the Tomcast. We talk about the universal language of visual art. Now, of course, the blind people may not work. You might need to go 3D sculpture to get the blind people involved in visualization. You might need to invent a dolphin-style sonar-equipped 3D rendering system. And I was thinking about that with dolphins. So we got some dolphins here, and they're they're pretty angry. Like dolphins are great because they look happy while they're angry, and it ends up looking like lowbrow, weird comic book art. But I, I think it's kind of cool. Lowbrow is uh, is fascinating and terrifying to me. It's, it's really weird, but I kind of like it because it's cartoony. It's accessible, but it's scary. So this, we got lowbrow dolphin right here. We will have a second lowbrow dolphin with laser beams attached to their heads because Doctor Evil, he had he had ideas. Doctor Evil had dreams. All right, so I'm already. This guy is just ready to party. I like I like giant marching band, uh, BNO railroad man who just wants to get it going. He's got the steam whistles. He's got the locomotive smoke. It's pretty dope. If you have this complicated idea and you want to make it accessible to people, well, you wrap it in something accessible. So, complicated idea. Locomotive man, who's a hundred feet high. What does that even look like? Marching band, very accessible. Many people have seen marching band. Okay, Brandon says, uh, got my Romeo 7 today, three months after ordering it. Wow, that took a while. That took a minute. China, 
Um, oh, have fun in the water. Granite says he's going out into the water. Granite is kayak man's, and kayaks are fun. Brandon says, you should see me. Typically when I'm watching your streams, I am working on three different customer computers while updating three pages of notes, managing other texts, monitors, chat room, petting the dog, responding to your Facebook, and eating a sandwich. Damn, that's that's the definition of multitasking, dude. All right, seems like we get like nine likes. Clint McCall, Chris Barkall, a lot of people liking the stream today. Thank you for liking the stream. I'm afraid to press buttons because I'm worried about it damaging the stream. I want to see who's all who's all liked the comment. I want to give you guys a thank you for liking it. Wow, uh, we've got a lot of people watching now. Just Brandon's watching. We got 11 likes and like Andrew Murray, thank you. Clint, thank you. Catherine, Suzanne, thank you. Amber likes it. Thanks, Amber. Thanks for saying you like what I'm doing. Uh, Forrest Stutler says, wow, cool, dude. Nice to meet you, Forrest. And Jason Anthony loves it. Thank you, Jason. I love you, too. All right, let's get down to it. I've got that Jackson State rhythm in my head. Oh, what did I do? I hit R. Sometimes you go real fast and you hit the wrong hotkeys. So that's another weird parallel process, isn't it? Something that your brain does without you thinking about it is keyboard interaction. Like my left hand kind of just finds buttons and hits them, and I'm not consciously thinking, oh, is it on the E key or the R key or whatever it is. Usually I figure out by pressing the wrong button, realizing I'm pressing the wrong button, and I change my hand movement from here to here, and then I press the same thing again. All right, how does this feel? in the broader context. You know what time it is. You know what time it is. It's time to flip it. Image rotation, flip horizontal. Does the image still work horizontally? And immediately, immediately we see it's unbalanced. Isn't that fascinating? Well, actually, wait a second. It wasn't fully composed. It lightens back up again. Let's see it. I saw a lot of weight around the ship with my fresh eyes. Let's save this guy just as a um, side. We're gonna call him uh, B and O man. You can't just call him B O man. That's not very nice. Body odor man. Now we're talking about the Baltimore Ohio Railroad. All right. Let's see. How do we feel about the composition? We're gonna use our handy dandy rulers. Control R take a look at where the midpoint is. You can either you can usually just select the whole image, left click on the ruler area, and it should snap. I probably have turned my snaps off. Window select filter, where is it? Is it under edit? Where is the snap controls? I think it was like control shift to control shift what are the two dots? Colon? Semicolon? Control shift semi so extras are there. Snap. Control plus shift plus semicolon. Yeah, okay, snaps on. So this usually snaps in the middle. There it is. Boom. 37 and a half inches, right in the middle. Now we can also go vertical too. Alright, so that's our horizontal and vertical snap lines. Do we have power points at our thirds? That's the next important thing. So, um, what's a good, quick way to get our third in? Well, I, I don't know. What's what's the fastest way to do your little third? I just kind of I kind of eyeball it. I'm just gonna take my red and eyeball. Let's be, take this half bit to something like something like that. Might be a third. This might might be a third so our, our power points are somewhere in here 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 and here and we don't really have anything like nailing those uh, rule of thirds power points in this piece we have like mr. and mrs. bow we kind of have the dolphins in the general area so we're kind of skewed. There's a dinosaur on the right side. There's the, the skyline on the left. Uh, they're not vacant, but they're not quite ideal. But you do like to have 
something neat and interesting on those PowerPoints. We're going to keep that in mind later. But how's the balance? Balance ain't bad. I feel like the constellation can go a little bit more left. But I'm saying but. But the left side's already pretty heavy. We have a lot more ink on the left side. We have just as much going on on the left side. We might have not as much on the right side. So the crazy idea I'm having right now is maybe I should flip the constellation. We're going to create another version of this. Create another layer. And for the sake of experimentation and self critique, we're going to take this drawing I did of the constellation and flip it around. Now, it, it's a mess because we have the dinosaur in the background. I um, might need to just redraw those lines. So control X, control V, and then edit trans should be edit transform flip horizontal. So if that's doing that, how do we feel about it? No, it's not going the right way. It feels like it's coming out that the ship is not coming from out of Federal Hill and it, it doesn't do that. So the reason it was the original way is because it's coming out of its birth. You know, sometimes you got to see it. Sometimes you just got to make that edit just to, to confirm whether you were originally correct or not. It's like a self course correction check thing. You got to just do it. You got marching steam man background. We got the dinosaurs. We're just going to keep. We're gonna keep the composition as is. Sometimes, if I if I'm worried about balance in the middle, I might extend one of the two sides, so that my midpoint, like for the for the midpoint of the ship to really be the true mid, I would have to extend along the right side uh, a little bit more drawing, and that wouldn't be bad. I could see resolving a little bit more of Domino Sugar Man, maybe smashing by the Visionary Art Museum on the right. Yeah, let's try that. Let's do it. Image canvas size. Let's expand that out. Let's give it five more inches. I mean, who doesn't want five more inches, right? Hold on. Who might? Well, you guys, an inch. You would really like five more inches. Talking about sandwiches, ladies and gentlemen. I'm thinking about that musical, like, paint. And like Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Oof. Oof. Poor dude. Person. I'm just going to lose these sketch in. This is the crane from the Baltimore Museum of Industry. It does not connect on the bottom. I think it's with wheels. The, the, the wheel roller, roller business. So Domino Sugar Factory is like, what's up, y'all? Um, what does the Visionary Art Museum look like? I don't even know. Vision. Google image search is great. Visionary Art Museum, it's got that really shiny front doohickeys. Maybe we're going to try to get a little bit of that. I mean, it's a cool building. I like visiting it. I think Firaxis had a party there in 2005. It was fun. It's all the Matchstick Titanic. Yeah, look at that. We'll cram the visionary in here. Uh, maybe a little bit of it. I have to flip this back around because it's backwards. Image rotation, uh, image, image rotation, horizontal. Um, back to normal. Let's hide. 
uh, or guidelines. I don't have a lot of room here, but it should be enough. What does this thing look like? You know what? It's not giving me the right angle I want either, because I want more of that right side. This is the image I'm looking at here. I want more of from this direction, this glass frontage. I might go to street view or something to so get a better view. Let's go to maps. Looking around Baltimore Harbor, what about the ammo? Boop, 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 boop. So there's the visionary. We are on, we're right up, right, oh. We actually see a picture of the camera device. It's some kind of drone street robot thing. Okay, so we have one vertical glass area and then brick and then some things. Can I go over? I, I want to do the road. I don't want to be on the sidewalk. Okay, there we go. There we go. This is what this is what I want. Ah, so there's all those apartment buildings that are on all the condos that are on the waterfront side. We're just not going to draw those because those are boring. Alright, so it's a round, half brick, half reflective two hickey building. Okay, move that over there. Those Mike's saying those Baltimore lemon peppermint sticks. I don't know what those are. I I was wondering earlier in the broadcast, did you make like, like lollipops on top? Baltimore lemon peppermint stick. Like, what is that? Oh, that's a Baltimore thing. Lemon peppermint stick. So it's it's a peppermint like candy cane and a lemon. I've never heard of that. What? What? The fuck? <laughs> this lady's drinking it. What is that? I, I need to go get one of those. This is a real thing. No idea. So with the lemon on it? Lollipop was a bad idea. That was good to remove. Okay. I didn't recognize. I thought they were eyeballs at first. I thought it was like crazy cartoon eyes. Alright, so dude, dude's going to be like belching out um, lemon lemon sticks, apparently. It's going to be coming out. You know what? Actually, we'll have... Um, I needed I needed the Oriole to be dropping something, so he's going to be dropping a lemon stick bomb. Is is what's going to be happening? He's dropping a couple uh, lemon stick shebangs. We're just going to be we're going to quickly give this thing some some color just so I can reference later what the heck it is because I'm not familiar enough with the lemon stick to remember. Maybe a terrible idea, but we'll get to it. So just we're just cheating out a little corner of the Visionary Art Museum. And there's that crazy wind chime that's that's on it. I wonder if that'd be fun to draw. And honestly, I don't know that much about architecture. It's a subject I probably should have taken a class in in art school and did not.
I mean, just just think about it. if the Domino Sugar Factory came smashing through the Vision Era Art Museum, all the matches that would go flying. You would think it's a fireworks factory. Just absolute chaos. We want Domino Sugar is just destroying artwork on a level no one's seen since Germany stole all the artwork from Europe in 1941. Monuments Men is a pretty good movie. Bill Murray. How the how the Allies got the artwork back. Pretty cool. I don't think I'm an art nerd. Like, there are definitely huge art nerds out there who know all about the uh, the Piet Mondrian and the Van Gogh and the Jackson Pollock and the Andy Warhol and get really really excited about the creations of other people. I get a little excited if the if the work itself speaks to me, but I'm not some like cult of personality um, worshiper of any of the great artists. Really, I think. I really think Leonardo da Vinci was on to a whole lot of things in like a renaissance, the true renaissance man, interested in a variety of the sciences, the child of the early enlightenment, maybe the pre-enlightenment, um, inventing things, changing, changing it up. He was just a dude. I think Mona Lisa was the first can't say in this broadcast. Uh, I'm going to have a separate s s separate secret broadcast to tell, share with you my secret opinions about the, what the Mona Lisa really was. I'd say it's a study in, study in looks. Like, he's really studying the sublime look. And I think it has to do with class, and I, has, I have to think it has to do with intention and universal communication. Because everyone from all over the world loves the Mona Lisa, and they can't quite put their finger on it. I think because he's done some very tricky but fascinating things with expression that play on a lot of double meanings that we have in in that language. Like I think expression is a way to see what people mean, but you can also be completely 100% wrong because the same expression can mean two very, very different things. And some people are better at picking up those subtleties. It's like sarcasm. Like if you don't know English and you come, let's say you grew up speaking Chinese, and you come to the United States and you have a tertiary understanding of, of English, and everyone's sarcastic, so they're saying the exact opposite of what they mean, but with an intention behind it, that subtle intention. It's like, I think expressions are like that. <laughs> Mike's saying, oh man, I should stay out of this. You're doing great without too many cooks up in here. That's pretty funny. Boom. I'll go back to the Visionary Art Museum and see if there's other details I could put in there. What is this? This construction on the left, the wind the weather vane? I kind of want the weather vane going flying. It's in this image somehow. I think the, I think the reason I like the Visionary Art Museum is because it was one of the first things I saw in downtown Baltimore. When I came to Baltimore as a student, in 2001, I toured the campus, and one of the first little field trips, I think, was to go down to the Inner Harbor and see what kind of art was around. I, I want to say I won my mom. She drove me down there, and she had a good time. I thought it was pretty weird, pretty weird, pretty funky. But it reminded us a little bit of some of the museums in Connecticut and New York State. There was a SUNY Purchase. Uh, it was an art school. 
SUNY SUNY Southern University New York um, purchase was the location. We went there a bunch in high school and middle school for field trips. They had a very quirky art collection. Popular field trip spot. Man, I feel so bad for teachers. What they have to put up with? All those kids like rambunctious, wild, trying to get up, trying to break the rules, bored. Timmy's beating up little Johnny. And little Mary's trying to kiss Timmy at the same time. What's going on? Everyone's causing trouble. You know, usually actually it wasn't the chicks trying to kiss dudes in classes or whatever. But still, nefarious. Yeah, I don't know how teachers keep it together. Dealing with all these little annoying kids <laughs> with their, their ridiculous needs and wants. What's this 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 windmill thing is ridiculous. I, I get the feeling this might be too much detail. So we're just gonna have like parts flying and someone who knows more about this thing will recognize what I'm doing here. Amazing! Like someone made this crazy weather weather vane windmill. This thing, this doohickey, and it still works. And it's been there for at least twenty years. Weather vane. Not giving me the images that I want. Oh, there it is. There's the thing. Absolutely wild. Hmm. <laughs> it's cool though. Why do we like details so much? Why do people like details? Does it have to do with the Mona Lisa? Does it have to do with the way we like eyes? And eyes are the secret language? Are the details the secret language of the universe around us? Secret language, secret knowledge gives us an advantage. We'll survive the winter if we have the secret information about what time the snows come so we know when to harvest our crops at the maximum yield point. Is that what it is? the little details okay so does this help balance we're adding all this detail information let's see select all drag the line to the middle middle point is right at the, the foremast of the constellation what more can you hope for what more can you hope for most of the time you don't want to divide your camera split in the middle we're breaking that rule intentionally because this is a drawing about a fight us versus them he versus she they versus they good evil Right now we're seeing just differences in line weight. We're actually dragging our eye around the canvas right now. Like the little spots of color are pulling our eyes right to them. The the heavier line weight of some of the objects I've spent more time drawing 
are drawing more attention to them. We'll see. If I just put more line weight underneath this crab, for instance, right now the crab is drawn very lightly. It wasn't intentional. It might have just been that's the brush I was using at the time. If I just put a heavier line underneath this crab guy, that starts to suggest shadow, gravity, weight. I just have a little bit more destruction. I think this is the rusty scupper. Um, <laughs> poor rusty scupper got got smooshed. Uh, I might draw out the sign rusty scupper there. Let's see. That might that might be cool. Rusty scupper uh, picture. I need a picture of it. Looks something like that. The rusty scupper. I might draw that. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a liberty here and put the sign on the first floor when it's really on the second floor. So let's do artistic liberty. I've never eaten at the Rusty Scupper. If you have, please comment. Tell me, is it worth my one hundred dollars? When I don't have a job to eat there. Well, maybe I have eaten there. I don't know how long it took me there once. Maybe we went there. Yes, did It's more interesting when you say it that way, isn't it? Must Captain Jack Sparrow. For being an artist, my handwriting totally sucks. It's bad. So when I get to draw some lettering, uh, it forces me to take my time, and it's suddenly better. And I remember, oh, my writing isn't bad because I'm bad. It's just because I'm impatient. I don't spend the time making my lettering legible. You still skip here. That'd be fun. What do we think? What do we think? Same thing goes for speech. Sometimes I just don't care about whether people understand what I say, so I just say as many things that come to mind at the same time, and no one understands it because I'm talking too fast. So I think talking too fast for me is the same breakdown in my brain as writing too fast is. Getting the message, getting the message out quickly is unrefined and unintelligible. Better to take a moment solidify your thoughts and deliver a clear and concise message. Quillis and Kevin Harmon like the stream. Thank you, Chris and Kevin. All you have to do is write a comment and I will say your name out loud inside my house. Say my name, say my name. This is an experimentation, ladies and gentlemen. You might think you're being entertained, but I'm being entertained. Maybe you know that. Maybe you can just tell Tom's having a good time talking to the empty room. But I'm learning. I'm being entertained, and I'm learning through drawing. I'm also being productive, which is pretty good. So I hope this inspires you all out there to draw, to be productive, to be creative, Journal. Journaling is amazing.
for me, it's, it's really important. This time when we're all going through history right now, I'm watching Ken Burns' The Civil War. I ponied up 40 bucks on Amazon to get that series. And the journals uh, for retelling that history are crucial for what it's like at the time. And maybe, you know, your journals won't make it to the National Archives, but they will be in your archives. And if you need to go back in time and tell uh, little Johnny or little Timmy in the future what it was like in the great 2020 COVID pandemic, uh, you got first party reference. What is it? First source, first. First, I don't know, spectator. What's the word I'm thinking? A witness? Witness protection? Got source data. Memory memory is really questionable, you know. You lose sharpness in memory. Memory and dreams. You know, it, things can get mucked up. But, but clearly your memory from twenty four hours is much sharper than from six weeks ago. There was that episode of uh, NPR serial talking about memory. But how trying to remember what you where you were six weeks ago just off the top of your head how do you do that you have to find context you have to drill in fact what were we doing okay well what day of the week was it was it thursday well usually thursdays i'm bringing the trash in what was i bringing was it a rainy day was it a sunny day help jog my memory to get back there help me to visualize it again help me to visualize what happened and then you have psyche psyche tacky where things speed up and slow down depending on how stressful they are that's why time goes by faster or slower. If you're in a car accident, like your brain is processing information at 120 frames a second, and you're able to remember all that. You're going to lose some mental capabilities either before or afterwards, but in the moment, you are processing, experiencing, and remembering something. It's like slow motion you hear about it, of soldiers in gunfights. Like they're falling to the ground, and they're getting their gun out of their holster to shoot the terrorists, and the uh, bam, John Wick bullet cam. That's where the concept comes from. Athletes, special moments in your life, change the way you perceive time. Okay, I'm running out of some steam, but what did we talk about today? We talked about composition, line work. I'm not going to get into color today. We did a drawing of marching band, B&O Railroad Museum man. I'm pretty thrilled with that guy. I got the Visionary Art Museum in just a little bit on the left. That supports where this poodle's coming from. We got some chaos. We got the, the crazy weather vanes going and flying. This is fun. Uh, my buddy El Medina always inspires me. I want to give a shout out to El. Uh, he just likes drawing like chaos and monsters and people fighting. And maybe in a way this is only possible because El draws such awesome deep uh, illustrations. Check him out. Eliezer Medina, works for Amtote. You know, go to the casino once in your life. Go play a game that Amtote has made and support L and have some fun while you're doing it. I'll tell you, when COVID lifts, we're all vaccinated and good again. I'm going to go to the casino. I'm going to go play one of L's games. I'm going to have a cocktail. I'm going to get one of those burgers from Guy Fiari's Burger Lounge. And um, salute Mr. Trash Wheel. Thank you, Mr. Trash Wheel. For uh, doing yo doing your thing, he's spitting right now. He's pissed, so he's spitting trash, it's trash out. Trash is going. There's a there's a two liter. It's gonna be a brick. Maybe it'll be a cinder block. Cinder block probably wouldn't float, so Mr. Trash Wheel wouldn't have it. It'd be kind of funny, like getting into a fight with Mr. Trash Wheel. He just throws all this lightweight garbage at you. I think he did have a tire in him once, so that might be interesting. I mean, it's not very nice to have tires near dolphins, but hey, this is Baltimore. I've actually spent a little bit of time in the Inner Harbor myself, and it was not a pleasant experience. The fire department took my clothes and burned them, and then gave me a three-part chemical shower. Tune in next week for the whole story of Tom Simons playing his Red Bull uh, Fluke Talk 2006. Tom jumps in the Inner Harbor, and firemen see his butt. From Dingleberry. Poor, poor fireman. See a lot of naked Baltimoreans that day. Stories next week. What are some thoughts I want to sh I want to share? Uh, I wrote some things. I wrote some notes for today's broadcast. 
Thoughts on The Mandalorian. Stories are for learning. The good tragedies tell us something about human nature, about the storyteller, about an event, about why things are the way they are. And that's what makes them engaging and universal and timeless, is if the message is good, it's going to be timeless. Kind of like biblical stories. I'm, I'm an atheist, but, but, some of those stories are good. Some of those parables, universal, pretty cool. The do unto others as you want to have done to you, pretty brilliant, pretty brilliant thing. I think the prodigal son is an interesting story. Like you, the fact that the, the host will give more to someone who he thinks he's lost than to someone who's been there the whole time. That's a that's an element of human nature that I think is universal. Not that everyone does it, but every culture kind of sees that thing happening. Like I'm celebrating because I thought I lost this thing, but no, I still have it. Versus you, I think I think that's a lesson that you have to reward people who have been by your side the whole time too. That's beside the point. Uh, science fiction, like the the Mandalorian and Star Wars, wraps these human stories in a attractive wrapper of sci-fi spaceships guns blasters the gunslinger the western western gunslinger rogue type makes it interesting makes it acceptable approachable uh, the brass tacks part of mandalorian is the pre-visualization was thorough and extensive in my career in games we talk a lot about pre-production and we've talked a lot about how there wasn't enough of it uh, pre-production was supposed to be the time when you figure out what are the problems you are going to solve and hopefully solve them? I don't think solving, I, I think pre-production is about discovering what problems you need to solve and then production is actually solving those problems. In manufacturing, production is just printing the object, making copies of it. Games really aren't that way because everything you make in a game is actually a prototype. The production part of games is replicating that thing in the world. I think the production part of games is actually playing the game. Because production in manufacturing is you have a system that produces a product. So you have, a, you have an assembly line of things, of machines and molds and robots that are cutting and taping and lasing and welding, and they're doing a process to end up with a result. But games, the process is the player playing the game. That's the production. Like a play, the production of the play is the play running. So the pre-production is all the the practice, the choreography, the rehearsal, the casting, the training, the set building. That's the pre-production. The production itself is the play, is the actual play. So this is all coming to my mind right now, but I think when game companies say we're going into production, I think that's a misnomer. I think that's the wrong term for it. Sometimes these terms get us, like, I've, we've gotten into trouble. You're into production. We should be making final assets. Well, but what if the production isn't what we think the production is? What if we're really in pre-production the whole time? So maybe I'm arguing for pre-pre-pre-production. I spent a lot of time in what we would call the prototype part of the project, which is where we're putting together the pitch, a playable interactive pitch or prototype of the game. And in... Uh, in manufacturing, let's say aerospace, for instance, the, the prototype planes, the X planes, these are handmade aircraft that cost hundreds of millions of dollars in custom made bespoke components that would later be mass manufactured. So the first X 35 costs like $300 million to make because it's the first one. Each one after that, once the assembly line has been created, is like $95 million bucks to make the next one. The first one's the most expensive. Watching ForgottenWeapons.com, Ian McCollum does a great job breaking down a lot of these pre-production models, these prototype weapons, and you get to see how crude they are and how they're kind of hammered together and fit together and hand filed stuff. And getting deep. What's the other thing I want to say? In good times, one must be extreme to stand out, but in bad times, one must just be level to stand out. So I think what we have right now is we have extreme times and extreme people, and it's just overwhelming. It's, it's overwhelming and unproductive. Um, we need love, more level-headed people right now. And there's a lot of level-headed people that just aren't talking. 
I think in the mainstream media, it's all these extremes. It's people who came out of the good times who are used to being up here, extreme, 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 and these times don't really call for it. I think these times call for level-headed conversation because there isn't an existential threat. We're seeing a lot more damage than um, national. Ex We're not seeing national existential threat. Local threats, yes, of course. Like, I know police officers who have gotten hit in the head by concrete. I know uh, of of uh, protesters who have been hit by rubber bullets. And so individually, yes, there are individual existential threats. I don't think there's a national or international or global um, existential threat. COVID is like one third of 1% fatality rate and then like 3% casualty rate that's not an existential threat in fact i don't think it's even significant like when in terms of significance is five percent so i think i think we just overreacted in a really big way yeah you'd, take, you'd be cautious to it but it's not the end of the world this is it's a very solvable problem i think we're getting there i think we're opening back up we're getting more masks to people i mean the big Big uh, breakthrough, I think, was the day I saw face masks in the supermarket. I was like, oh yeah, this is this is what we need. This is what we need. And now, moving forward, there will never be a time from now until the heat death of the universe when you cannot get a face mask at a supermarket in America or a truck stop. Maybe a truck stop. But I think we're going to have PPE. It's going to be a product like deodorant. It's just available. Face masks will just be available. Maybe that was already the case in in Asia. So, hour 16 minutes. I'm running out of steam. I don't know if anyone's watching anymore. But I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to me, Blabalon. I'm glad you were uh, able to share this wonderful day. And um, be better. Do better. Be better. Be smarter. Have conversations with people. Listen. Stop posting crazy shit on Facebook. It's really annoying. <laughs> be civil to each other uh, thanks a lot everyone take care